for his word where will we be tonight without the word of the lord so let's just look at this together tonight father we come in agreement in the name of jesus we thank you lord for such an open heaven here your presence and lord even where people are at the holy spirit move it upon every one of us people are going to be listening to this or watching this video i thank you lord for the holy spirit just breathing upon us moving upon us wherever people are, an invasion of the presence of God, and by your Holy Spirit helping us to have good soil of hearts and minds and lives, that the Holy Spirit help us, anoint our eyes, our ears, that we have eyes and ears of the Spirit. Jesus rebukes some people, they have eyes, but they don't see. Lord, we want to be able to see what, the, what you're showing us. We want to be able to hear what you're saying, and the Holy Spirit help us to have good soil of hearts and minds that we're humble and teachable, and that the word go out as living seed sown into good soil. The parable of the seed and the sower watered by the Holy Spirit, the rain of the Spirit. And it will take root in our lives, grow and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. And Lord, we thank you that your word will not return void, but accomplish that which you sent it for to do. And so we take authority over the enemy. The, bird, the birds here try to steal seed, so we take authority in Jesus' name. Anything trying to hinder this, we commit to be bound and back off right now from this word being preached. In Jesus' name, you will go from it. It will get where it's supposed to, and it will accomplish what's supposed to. And Lord, we thank you for your mighty angels just clearing away any resistance, and we commit this unto you, and we agree together everything will be accomplished, and through this that your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so as we get into this, now this is just the beginning of a, of a series, and uh, as I look into this, first off, there's a prophecy on the back of these notes here but I just I want to start with that but and then I'll come back to it at the end and we'll get into several scriptures but God is a God of restoration but as we can see in the word of God many times before there can be a restoration there has to be some type of a breakthrough a deliverance a clearing away of the enemy how many knows and I'm the first one to raise my hand that God has had to deliver us from some things I mean he's had to set us free from some stuff I myself you know God has had to liberate me many from many things many times back in the past so I could move in freedom to be up here doing what I'm doing in my early years in my Christian walk there was there was things God had to set me free from it was it was serious and I think people saw an anointing or saw a calling and would you know, draw me in to help with different things in music or help with uh, youth or whatever, but God was still having to do a work in me on a personal level. That I could get to this place of being able to get up here and minister like this. So deliverance is a powerful thing. And I'm going to read this, and then we're going to look at some scriptures I think will be a blessing to you. And this is just beginning to kind of set our teeth into this whole series where I'm going to deal with deliverance, spiritual warfare, a little bit about demonology, but we need to cover some things. So anyway, this is a prophetic word by Kenneth Hagin Sr., Kenneth Hagin Sr., back in 1983. I'm only going to give the first part of it that has to do with deliverance. In subsequent sermons, I'll give the rest of it. But I'm focusing tonight on deliverance. Now, I want you to see something interesting. He said, in this move, in this move, in this move. He said it three times. Now, Kenneth Hagin is somebody that I have a lot of respect for, especially about the prophetic. He was very prophetic, very accurate as a prophet, and had a very powerful teaching ministry and healing ministry. In this move, in this move, in this move. Isn't it interesting, not that this is necessarily what he's saying here, but could the Holy Spirit be saying something like this? You remember historic revival series that I did? We saw that there was a wave that started back in the mid-1700s with the Wesley brothers and Jonathan Edwards and all, but it swept, and then God added to it in the days of Topeka and Azusa, and that was like a second wave, but it was added to the first. And then the third wave was added on top of that in the early 90s with the revivals that broke out then of the glory. So it began with a move for souls, but God added 
in the days of Topeka Power. You remember this? There was like three distinct waves. Well, I wonder about this. Could he be saying something in this move, in this move, in this move, that that last move, that final move, the great, the great move of God that will precede the coming of Jesus? Anyway, he said, in this move that is about to come, and even you're in the edge of it now, and this was in the 80s, it will not be altogether something new that you've never seen. It will be a, look at this, combination of everything you have seen put together. How many knows that God's got a major move about to happen? I'm telling you, everything that we've seen in the past, every move of God coming together, and he said, as it's a combination of everything you've seen put together and then plus a little more. In this move of God that is just about to spring upon you, there will be a manifestation of casting out demons that you have, haven't seen. Casting out demons. Now, some have drawn back from casting out demons. We see that even today. There, there's people that... That, that have this type of ministry like we do, and they people give them a hard time about it. There are ministers out there that are casting out demons, and there's people telling them that if they want to be more successful and more um, accepted by the greater body of Christ, etc., they need to shy away from it. it. Man, Satan is going to do everything he can to keep this from happening, amen? And he said... Some have drawn back away from it, but the Spirit of God says, I began a move along the, these lines a few years ago. Remember, this was in the 80s, right? A few years back. And he said, and men aborted the move. I remember about those days. Listen, Derek Prince was really a pioneer, but there was a real move in the 70s where God began to tell Derek Prince, I am going to wage war against witchcraft. And God began to use him and others. Uh, Don Basham, and I, I believe it's his name, Bob Mumford, there were several others that God began to really come upon them and teach the greater body of Christ. And Derek Prince began to write the books that came out, uh, Thou Shalt you know, Expel Demons and Blessings and Curses you, you Can Choose. And all of that began a real move. But here's the thing. There were mainline denominations that have millions of people in them that labeled them heretics because they were casting out demons. And Derek Prince, he's, he's such a sweet guy, very humble. He's not saying it in an arrogant way. He said, he said this. He said, well, I guess they would just soon me leave them in there. What am I supposed to do? And they would have, actually. So... Man came in, man's control, a religious spirit rose up, aborted the move of God, and then it said, uh, Kenneth Hagin said, they mixed some of their own thinking in on it, and they tried to control it. Yes, they did, and do it according to pattern. And according to this way, and we think it ought to be done this way or whatever, and they begin to change some things, they brought mixture but you, but Kenneth Higgins goes on to say, but you haven't seen anything yet of what you're going to see in dealing with demons. For demons are let loose upon the earth and they're going about as never before because they know their time is short. And so in this multiplication, this advance of demon activity, there will be an activity of the Holy Ghost. Demons that have harassed men, demons that have held ministries in check will leave. And you will have, you have not seen yet what you will see in the area of dealing with demons, casting out demons, and exercising authority over demons. And we're about to step into it like you step through a door into another room. This has not been fulfilled yet. It's about to be fulfilled. I believe with all my heart before Jesus comes, and man, we're living in a time where there's so much dark activity going on and Satan is really hammering down and you can see so many people that are opening doors to the demonic realm. I mean, sexual immorality is just very common and, and doing all kinds of 
ungodly substances people are putting in their body has just become very common. And dabbling and messing with the occult has become very common. And things that are targeting children. There are goofy, uh, even Christian parents, believe it or not, that are very comfortable with their kids just, I mean, enamored with things like Harry Potter. But if anybody ever gets up and, like my wife, and gives a testimony, they'll throw a fit. Have a little meltdown. They'd much rather their kids watch Harry Potter than hear how Jesus delivers people from that stuff. I'll come back to some things later, but I want to read, go to the top of your notes on the front page, restoring the ancient ruins. It's just common sense that this is an area that the devil wants to steal from the body of Christ. I believe in many ways he has stole it. And when God tried to restore it back through people like Derek Prince, it, I mean, they faced a backlash, backlash about that like you've never seen. And so God still used it. But like Kenneth Hagin said, it wasn't able to really get the traction it needed to because too many in the body of Christ didn't want it and were opposing it. But let's look at what, what does the Bible say? How many knows God has the final word? Amen. So Isaiah 58 verse 11, whenever we pray fast and give and consecrate our lives unto God and we humble ourselves before him, the Lord promises us, he said, and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. You will be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. That's revival. And then he says, and those from among you will re rebuild the ancient ruins. Raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of the breach and restore the streets to dwell in. So God is going to restore back the Bible says about Jesus, heaven must receive him until the restoration of all things. God is the God who will restore the years the locusts have eaten. And it doesn't matter how much the devil wants to use uh, religious people to try to stop this. I really believe this. No matter what the devil tries to do, before Jesus Christ catches away his bride in the air, there's going to be a revival as such that man won't be able to hinder it and the devil won't be able to stop it. God will deliver people. He will. He's going to come down and do it whether the religious people like it or not. And if he has to, he'll do it like he's done in days of old. John Wesley couldn't minister in the church world because the church world didn't like his gospel message. Think about that for a minute. But the church world did not like the fact that he believed in some kind of personal salvation in a new birth like we believe to. And so they persecuted him right out the door. You know what God did? He said, fine, then I'll take it out on the streets. And Wesley saw a great revival outside the church walls. If, if the church won't receive the revival God's going to send, then fine. Then we'll just go set up a tent somewhere and let millions of people get saved that way. If the church don't want it, there are people out there that do. Now, this may be a little bit different scripture, but let me explain. It's Jeremiah 6, 14. He said, they have healed also the wound of the daughter of my people lightly and neglected saying peace peace when there is no peace now let me let me give you something to think about just look this way don't look at the notes for a minute there, i heard a minister tell this story and i don't think there's a better example than this story so i'm going to use his example he said that he was in the military and there was a, a bomb that went off and some shrapnel went into a guy's shoulder but they didn't know they just saw wounds you know and he was working with this doctor to try to patch people up and get people um, into the medical area. And he said that he went to put dressing on this guy's wound. All you saw was a wound. And he was going to put dressing on it and patch him up and send him on his way. And the doctor said, oh, wait a second, We're, we need to do something first. He said, give me, give me the probe. And he gets this probe and he begins to move down in the wound until he found down in there that you couldn't see with the naked eye. He found... Uh, the shrapnel and of course when he hit it the guy yelled and jumped up he said all right now give me um, the forceps and he gets in there and he pulls out the shrapnel now once he gets that out then he said now we can dress it and it'll heal up normal and how many knows if you didn't get that shrapnel out and you just dressed it it would get infected it wouldn't be able to heal and that is exactly I, I heard that story 
you can't use a better example than that story. How many times have we seen in the body of Christ people have all kinds of problems? And we, those of us that know these things and understand these things, okay, I'm speaking to people that know these things, we know that a lot of times it's demonic. Behind the scenes, the enemies at work there. And they have all kinds of wounds and problems and issues that are not really being dealt with. They're just kind of like putting a Band-Aid on it. And they're being told, well, if you'll have enough faith and if you'll just confess the word and you'll do this, that, and the other, then and to a degree, there's some truth in all of that. But if you don't get that probe down in there and figure out where the root problem is and then pull that out, it will never really get healed. You understand? Yeah, if it is a demonic spirit, and if it is something like that, if it is a deliverance issue, and I believe many times it can be, if you ignore that issue and just try to bandage their life, it will never truly be dealt with, and they'll struggle their entire life to the grave with it. The only way you're going to get that shrapnel out of there is to probe down in there and pull it out. Y'all hear what I'm saying? The probing is the Holy Spirit exposing it. The pulling out is the driving out the enemy's influence. You will leave in the name of Jesus. There, there are people that have all kinds of physical uh, problems, all kinds of mental and emotional torment. There's all kinds of division type problems in families. I could go on and on. The enemy is tormenting. And to really get the victory over that, it's got to be rooted out, okay? And sometimes, just like Isaiah 58 shows us, these kind only come out but by prayer and fasting. And Isaiah 58 shows us how to fast, and it says that healing will come. You know, that God, uh, our light brave foot like the dawn, our healing quickly appear. But many times to get the healing and the breakthrough the stronghold, the yoke removed or whatever, it takes some prayer and fasting. And prayer and fasting is like the probe that exposes it. But then we have to use our faith and command it to leave. And if there's any reason why it's there, like a legal ground, that needs to be dealt with too. So the Holy Spirit will reveal that. But how many times have, have church world, the church world said to people, you know, peace, peace, but there's no peace. They tell people, well, just do this, that, and the other. It'll be okay. But truthfully, until you probe down in there and get out whatever it is that's tormenting them, they're not going to be okay. And I, I've seen this over and over and over again. And in the ministry, I've seen, I don't know how many people we've seen through the years delivered of things, but people have had physical problems completely disappear by a spirit leaving them that was attacking their body. We've seen people that's had all kinds of mental problems disappear when a tormenting spirit left their mind. People that had emotional trauma, which that's very understandable, and in and of itself needs to be healed, but many times there'll be a tormenting thing on that emotion. And until that's removed, it's not really possible for them to get on the other side of it because that torment remains. People that are tormented by the enemy, they're restless, they can't find peace, uh, something is tormenting them, something will, will cause them to have maybe panic attacks, uh, uh, difficulty sleeping at night, or, or just in a home, just, it doesn't take hardly anything to stir up some kind of conflict. See, that's a spirit. It's a spirit of strife. And you, people need to recognize, for example, you know, a husband and wife love each other. Things are fine, and they, they get along normally until they're on their way to church. And then all of a sudden, it seems like every time they're wanting to go to church, something tries to stir up a fight between them. Or every time God's wanting to use them, conflict tries to stir up. That's a spirit. So instead of just saying, well, we'll just ignore this thing, and it's something wrong with us. If, if Look, you can tell somebody, just renew your mind, just... Uh, react differently just say something differently when that comes and all that has its place but if you're dealing with a spirit that's trying to follow around and create conflict that thing is going to keep doing it till you confront it 
Does this make sense? So you can keep ignoring it and you can suppress that. You can renew your mind. You can use a different tone of voice and, and you can try to do everything you can to keep peace. But until you drive that spirit out that is causing that conflict, you're still going to have to deal with it. So that's just one of many examples. But all right, let's look at Mark chapter 1. When Jesus, it was the time for him to enter his ministry, he goes to John and he's baptized in water. And once he's baptized in water, the Holy Spirit clothes comes upon him and the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness. And once he got out into the wilderness and faced the devil, he was led by the Spirit. But after that, the Bible says he came out of that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so once he came back, this was really his first recorded miracle in the ministry. I know the water and the wine, but that was before his time uh, of entering ministry. After he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit, after he confronted Satan, it says that they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath day, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as scribes. This is Mark 1, 21. And verse 23 says, just then there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, what business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. After throwing him into convulsions and crying out with a loud voice, the unclean spirit came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He commands even unclean spirits and they obey him and immediately news about him spread everywhere into the surrounding region of Galilee. But I want you to, to notice some things here. Number one, this took place in church. See, a lot of times here in America where people consider this to be kind of sophisticated and a first world country and all of that and that they view demons as being only in some obscure place out in maybe like a third world country or, or it's just superstitious or maybe if anything it's just among those that really have problems and they, they just want to view it that way but that's not always the case. If you look at this story, first off, this was right in the house of God, and it was right there among the people of God. You understand what I'm saying? These were God's covenant people. Y'all listen to me tonight. God's covenant people need to be set free from things that have oppressed their lives many times. And this was, this was a group of people. See, I think many times people look at, well, if you go off into somewhere like Haiti or you go to other places where there's all this other stuff, voodoo and witchcraft, but these were people here that were not into idolatry. These were people that, that were God's covenant people in church. And whenever Jesus started teaching with authority, look at what it says. All of a sudden, that spirit manifested in a person right there in church. Would y'all be okay with that? I think River of Life would. But how many knows there's a lot of churches out there, God bless them, that would not be okay with this? So let's just say, let's just take the Bible literally now, and let's just believe it for what it says. And now let's take it into this service right now. What if I was preaching up here just like Jesus was doing, and somebody all of a sudden manifested a spirit and begin to say to me, what are you doing here? What are you saying to us? Have you come to cast us out? And I was to say, shut your mouth and come out in Jesus' name. And listen, and the person hits the ground, convulsing. This is in your Bible. I just read it. They hit the ground. They're violently convulsing on the ground. And then they let out a loud scream. I've heard this. It's blood-curdling scream. And then they the demon leaves the person how many in river of life would be like amen that's awesome praise god you know i would but there's a lot of churches and i could give a story comes to mind where my wife took this lady that came out of satanism and got saved to a church because the lady knew she had demons i mean she got saved water baptized 
If I remember right, she was baptized Holy Spirit at this point, right? They had prayed for her. I believe that she was. But she knew she still had some demons in her life. So she, she was like, please take me somewhere. Because a lot of churches won't deal with this. So she was telling my wife, take me somewhere that they will actually cast demons out. So she, she took her to this Pentecostal church. And you would think that those of us that's grown up spirit-filled, you know, let me tell you how it went down. So they bring her there, and the pastor goes by, and uh, he sensed it and put, just used his Bible on her head. She fell out and just began to manifest demons. I mean, cursing. She has supernatural strength, mind you, because grown men were holding her down. My father was one of them, and she was picking up a grown man on her back like this, picking him up in the air, and then a grown man uh, off the ground. She has supernatural strength you know, kind of cussing like a sailor. Now, granted, it wasn't her. It was the demon doing it. But there were, they were several, I would say probably around a dozen spirits. And that pastor stood there and cast them out of her, and they left her. But he, that's wonderful. That's, that's Book of Acts, biblical Christianity. That's what Jesus did when he walked the earth, okay? This is, if you're a Christian, that should be normal to you. Now, that happened, but here's the response of the church. The religious people ran out in the foyer, God bless them, like a bunch of wimps and sissies. If they're watching, I am making fun of you. I love you, but that's pathetic. They all ran out there in the foyer. They were all scared of the devil. And when the pastor got done praying for this lady, he goes out there and they're telling him, well, pastor, we don't want this in our church. Let me tell you something. That grieved the Holy Spirit and God heard that. Don't expect God to keep moving in a church like that. If I was the pastor, I would let him have it. So anyway, that, you know, so what, where is she supposed to go get help then if she can't go to church to get help? And they rejected her. And, of course, that's how she felt. She never came back because she knew that they had rejected her and what God did. She didn't want to come back. I don't blame her, but that's the condition of the church. And whenever, it's a beautiful testimony, but it's, it's ruined by the religious. So anyway, the Lord wants to come in power and deliver people. And we, my wife and I have, have had so many stories like this. I mean, in the, even in this place, several times I've seen people deliver from demon spirits. And I remember one young lady, I was just praying for people on the altar, and she, she fell out really hard, and I knew it was a demonic commanded to leave, and it came out of her, and I saw it leave, and she, she gets up like a lot of people do. What was that? And uh, I really felt it was a spirit of witchcraft. And I asked her, have you... Did you mess around with that? She said, well, yeah, when I was in school, I played around with witchcraft, but I didn't think anything of it. And I said, well, the devil did. And look, you know, you obviously had a demon from it. And she's like, yeah, I agree. And so anyway, she got delivered. And I told her, I said, then quit mess. Don't go back messing with witchcraft again. This is what happens. So anyway, there's a bunch of stories like that. But the gospel has got to be preached in power. And it, it is a direct confrontation of evil spirits and I remember you know if you if you minister just in a lot of churches there was a man um, brother Tillery I'm hoping he's okay with me using his name but, but anyway he had pastored in a particular denomination that did not believe Christians could need deliverance and that's actually common unfortunately in this particular denomination he had preached for them for 50 years he was a pastor in this denomination. Think about 50 years, how long that is. And he said to me, as I spent some time with him, he told me, he said, well, when I turned like 70, I believe is what he told me. He said, when I turned 70, I started realizing I'm getting older now. And he said, I told the Lord, he said, up until this point, you've used me in certain ways, but I'm 70 years old. I don't know how much longer I've got to preach. And he said, I really want you, I will yield myself to you, and I want you to use me in a different and in a greater way than you ever have been able to. And he was praying like in a shed he had. He told me all about this. And he said the Holy Spirit came upon him and power and knocked him on the ground. And the Lord spoke to him, I'm anointing you to deliver my people. Whew. So after that, he began to have divine appointments with people. And this is what he told me, he said, Scott, listen. He said, if you're just going to a lot of these typical churches where, where, where people are, are a certain way, he said, you're probably not going to see a lot of this. But if you'll start going to people that really are hurting and need uh, the Lord to show up, 
He said, God will move with great deliverance. I thought that was really an interesting statement. It reminds me of the Laodicean church. We're in rich of need, in need of nothing. The Lord said, well, that's not really true. But anyway, but he said, if you'll go among the hurting people. And I, he came to a place I was at, and he took an interest in me because people were being delivered. And he, he, he also kind of joined in, and we both prayed for people. And he told me about all of this and prayed with me, but it was quite powerful. But I remember there were multiple times that people were delivered from demonic spirits. And I'm kind of moving around different time frames. I've prayed with people. But just to give you some examples, our, the, when you, listen, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The devil is not scared of me and you, but he is really concerned about the power of the Holy Ghost on us. He, he is very concerned when we understand who we are, that we have authority in Christ, and we come under the anointing, and we begin to operate as Jesus did. He's very, he gets concerned there. And I remember I was praying for people one time, and it was at this uh, younger group, college age, Man, I saw a lot of people liberated. But at this particular group, there was a lot of people from all over the world. And I remember just going through and praying. There was a young lady. I can't remember. I think she was from the Middle East, maybe India. But she, she was standing there, her feet together, standing there. And when I got to her, began to pray for her. I don't know how to explain this on camera. But her, her feet were planted like this. And her body was doing this. And I'm sitting there watching this. Wow. And so, and Jesus, I commanded the enemy to leave. And that thing just hit her. If I remember right, she was thrown to the ground, something left. But, I mean, there are so many stories of just crazy stuff. I mean, people kind of writhing on the ground. There was a story a dear friend of mine told me. <laughs> she she was telling me this story, and it was, it was funny the way she was telling it. But anyway, she said that she was in this church, and it was a powerful church. This was a church that knew how to pray, and this was back in the 90s, and they were seeing a move of God. And she sat in the far back, and the ministers of the church were related to her through marriage. And so she was just in the back, just worshiping, enjoying the Lord. And all of a sudden, because she was in the back, she could see this. And she said that um, there was a message in tongues interpretation. And I don't remember because this happened in like 97, 8, somewhere in this. I do not remember the details of the interpretation. But it was something to this effect. There's a snake among us, okay? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember that because she said she was just worshiping. All of a sudden, there's a message in tongues. There's a snake among us. And, you know, you don't hear that every day. And so she's kind of like, oh, what in the world? And all of a sudden, she says she saw somebody not far from her, kind of toward the back, collapse. And she's like, looking. She said that this person fell on the ground and was slithering like a snake under the pew. And she's, she's watching this. She's a first-hand witness. She said, what in the world? And they went under a few pews or something, and they popped back up. And a lot of people didn't see this because they're, they're in the back. And she said they popped back up, and I was laughing while she was telling me this. Anyway, and she said then they took off in the aisle, and they ran out of the church. And so she's one of the few people that witnessed this whole scene. Plop down they go, slither they went, pop back up, ran out of the church. And she was sitting there just, you know, mid-worship while this is happening. There they go. And they're back to hallelujah, you know, just back to worship. <laughs> She was telling me this all serious, and it was hilarious the way she was saying it. But, but it, you know, God exposed that. But how many knows that the devil came to church that day and God kicked him out, amen? So we, we need to recognize that there are spiritual forces at work, okay? And there's people that need deliverance. I mean, just there, there's, there's so many stories of things. And I remember this precious lady, we are praying with her, and she was African descent, and she had picked something up at some point. But she had come to me, and my wife and I were praying with her in Austin. You might remember this lady. She was really sweet. But she was like, I really feel like I need deliverance from something or, or set free. But I don't know. She was saying, I don't know that I really understand all this or even really believe in all this, but I know that there's something. And I said, well, let's just pray. 
And so I led her through like a renunciation. So kind of like the uh, deliverance questionnaire, kind of a one size fits all. And we just led her through some prayers. And all of a sudden, she like squeezes one of our hands. I think she squeezed my hand. Her eyes got real big and she got really scared. And she, something left her. And she said, dear God, I felt something come out of me. And I said, well, the Lord delivered you. Amen. Praise God. There was something there. And she's a sweet lady. But look at what the Bible says in Mark 16, 17. It says, and these attesting signs will accompany those who believe. In King James, it says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, what's the very first thing? In my name, they will drive out demons. That's the first thing. Did y'all see that? What was the first thing after Jesus came back from facing the devil in the wilderness? What's the first thing the Bible says? He got up and taught with authority and cast a demon out of somebody. That was like ministry opportunity number one. Did y'all pick up on that? It was a demon being confronted and driven out. And the very first thing Jesus says, these signs will follow you. The first thing he says is, you will drive out demons in my name. Then he says, you'll speak in new tongues. That's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And then at the latter part of it, they will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But the first thing is, drive out demons. So this should be a normal part of Christianity. And I've, I've told some of these stories before, so I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to keep on on with the same stories, but there's been several deliverances through the years. And a lot of times people, I don't draw a lot of attention to it, but there's a lot of times that people are delivered from things and they're not sure. All of a sudden they just hit, get hit by the power and they feel different, like something is different. What that actually was, was God set them free from something, you see. It was hindering them. And they didn't really know how to put words to it. They're not even sure what happened. They just know that they came in one way and they left another. But what that was really was God was clearing something out of their life that was oppressing them. Uh, let me show you a couple more things. Um, the Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and then uh, Peter quoted this. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that word saved is sozo in the Greek, which means save, heal, deliver, protect, preserve, prosper, make to do well, make whole. So what that's really saying there is all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be healed. Does this make sense? So there, there's something there, a promise of deliverance. And then you see in Joel 1 through Joel 2, Read chapters 1 and 2 of Joel, and you see that the people of God got into sin, and so God allowed the army to come in, and, and the Lord described the army like the Midians or whoever it was that was attacking. They were coming in, destroying their crops and, and, and just devouring everything. And the Bible describes them like insects, that they were like locusts coming in, like this military. They're like locusts coming in. And it talked about the, what the palm oil, the canker worm and all that. But it's saying that it just wiped out everything. They were destroying their, their you know, taking their um, animals. They were taking uh, their crops. They were burning their fields. Great destruction. But what it's saying there is, if you read the whole thing, Joel was saying, look, call a solemn assembly and, and humble yourself in prayer and fasting. And the Lord will drive away this northern army and he'll restore the years the locusts have eaten but it's our responsibility to humble ourselves and repent of our sin what allowed this in what allowed the enemy to attack us and what what has opened the door that we confess and repent of it and we deal with it and we humble ourselves in prayer and fasting he said the lord will deliver and then the lord will restore and he said the Lord will pour out his spirit. And Joel was, I mean, uh, Peter was quoting some of this. He quoted another part of this where he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. All of this was in this context out of Joel. 
And Peter was quoting this, but see now what we're dealing with in the church is we're not really dealing with like physical battles with people, with guns and knives and actual warfare like Israel was. What are we facing? Demonic spirits that are trying to come in against us and trying to steal, kill, and destroy. They're trying to infest. They try to be like Satan's fifth column to get in people's lives in churches and cause all kinds of problems. And so the Lord's saying, look, the demonic forces have come in. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord and pray and repent and drive them out. The Lord will help us get all that out. And then you're going to see the restoration of the years the locusts have eaten. Then you're going to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit you've been believing for. But there has to be this breakthrough. Is this making sense tonight? So many times churches will avoid this subject like the plague. Man, they do not want to talk about it. It's too controversial. But I keep going back to this. The very first thing Jesus saw, he was led by the Spirit out there. But when he came back, he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit, clothed with power. And when he stood up to preach under that anointing, the very first thing that happened was a demonic spirit manifested before him. It was the power of, that whole, of the Holy Spirit that stirred that up. And Jesus cast that thing out. And I think about when they went to the Gadarenes and there was a man there that had, you know what the Bible says, a legion of spirits. Obviously there was one leader that was speaking through the guy. But he was saying, we're legion for we're many. If that's literal, a legion of Roman soldiers was like 6,000. So if that was that many in that one guy, little wonder he was running around naked in the tombs, you know. The guy was insane. But, you know, anybody that had that many demons in them would be insane. But it's, it was interesting to me that when Jesus came in on that boat, I mean, as soon as Jesus put his feet on the beach and stepped in there, that demoniac jumped up and started screaming and running at him and fell down before him. Because there was a confrontation with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. When Jesus showed up and his feet touched the soil, heaven invaded earth and hell was concerned about it. It was immediate. I believe that man didn't even himself would have never even known that somebody came in on the beach. But the demons recognize the power of God show up. You understand? I really believe God's about to do something. Uh, I try not to say too much about this in my sermons because this goes out to a much broader audience than River of Life. But I believe God's about to do something, River of Life, here, where God's about to finish something that he's begun and then he's going to open a door and there's going to be a major revival and in that i'm telling you it's near and in that revival god is going to deliver people so i want you to be ready for that and comfortable with it because i could see <clears throat> even without having to work the altars as much just from the pulpit us just taking authority and just the lord just sweeping out because god wants people free and they may not can go to a lot of places because a lot of those places won't receive them. Then I just say to the Lord, send them here, you know. And I, I believe River of Life will welcome that. But a lot of places won't. I don't think God can really send the fullness of what he wants to do in revival to a lot of places because they'll be ticked off at people getting delivered. They won't like how, how messy revival is. Because you have so many people come in and they're hit by the power of God and they just manifestations of the Holy Spirit everywhere. I mean, do you remember, Sandy will remember, do you remember the time that we had those youth groups all come together? There was a lot of people there. And me and a few other youth pastors were, we were all kind of working together. So it was like a revival for younger people. And we had them just coming through like a fire tunnel. And it was so powerful. When they got to some point, they were literally hit by the power of God like struck by lightning. We, we, we had to just drag them off everywhere we could.
But there were people all around. I'm standing there just looking around. There'd be people over here laughing hysterically. Then you look over, over here and people are bawling. You look over there and somebody's shaking so hard they're coming off the ground. I mean, people speaking in tongues, they just got baptized in the Holy Spirit. It looks like pandemonium, and, and a lot of churches don't like that. Because why? Because they want to be in control. Everybody say control. That's the problem. Instead of just letting the Holy Spirit be in control, because I'm going to tell you what was happening that, light, that night. Destiny was being birthed in young people. Young people were were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Young people were being delivered from things. Young people are being healed. I mean, their lives are being transformed. And I promise you that they'll look back on that time. They'll never forget what they experienced. And the church world would have shut it down. A lot of people don't realize, uh, you know, I think about that Jesus revolution. Of course, everything's got to be controversial, you know. So here we are, midst of controversy again. But, you know, I'd studied this thing out for years before there was ever this movie. I didn't even know they were making this movie. So I knew, I knew about all this stuff. And I think about Lonnie and, man, Lonnie, the reason why God used him, I believe, is just because he was not religious. That was the thing. See, he wasn't trying to control everything. He just wanted God to move. But he was being told by some of the leadership. Now, this is, this is what they told him. This is a bunch of theatrics. Because he'd be preaching, and he would say, God's healing somebody over here. God, there's a deaf person, God, and they would get healed. Okay, history records that they did get healed. The movie didn't, but they did get healed. And there'd be people fall out under the power of God. But this is, this is how it got. The leadership was saying there, this is a bunch of theatrics, and they said this. They said, we'll, we'll let you minister, and when you start praying for people, the first person that falls on the ground, we're shutting down the move, we're shutting down the meeting. He's having to hold people up, and, and Lonnie was a small guy. He's having to hold people up so they wouldn't fall. Do you understand a little bit more as to why he finally got a belly full of it and said, "I'm out of here"? That's why. Okay, the movie didn't bring that out, but I'm telling you, that's what happened. And so my, my daughter came in and said, Dad, you got to go see the movie. And I said, well, the problem is, is I already studied this, and it makes me mad. <laughs> and she said, well, they did a pretty good job about bringing out what you just told me. And I said, all right, so I went to see it. And it was good. I'm glad I saw it. I, it. It was really powerful. It was awesome. But there were some things that they left out. I mean, significant things. But, of course, if they had put it in the movie, then they would have had to spend another hour explaining it in the movie. So I can see why they did it, because you can only do certain things in movies. But whenever you try to control the move of God, I used to just get a kick out of some meetings. Like, I remember I went to this Rodney Howard Brown meeting one time, and um, the Holy Spirit just fell. I mean, it was powerful. And there was people, just a whole group of people laughing. I mean, people are laughing, falling out on the floor and everything. And I was just thinking to myself, if there's any religious person here, they're going to be so mad right now. And one guy, <laughs> I mean, what are you supposed to do? Brother Roddy's up there trying to preach. You know how funny he is anyway. He's up there, he's walking, the Holy Spirit's falling, and some guy gets touched. He de- I guess he doesn't know what to do, so he runs and does a cartwheel. And then goes and sits down. <laughs> And this brother Rodney's just sitting there like this, I'm hand up, mid mid stride, like watching the guy go sit down. And I laugh because brother Rodney caught him by surprise. He said, "Well, we asked the Lord to show up, and so we can't be mad when He does." You know what are you supposed to do with these things? So when the Holy Spirit though moves, there's going to be a lot of things, and so just be ready for the for the lost to be saved. But the healings and the miracles, the deliverances, and all the, the messy stuff, if you will, of revival because the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that really upset the religious. You understand? They hate it. They hate revival. There's something of a, a I believe it's a demonic thing. It's a religious spirit. But that stirs up in them, and they hate it, and they want to criticize it and shut it down. And it's all about control. And Derek Prince warned all of us about that demonic control. How many knows when you get into manipulation, intimidation, domination, you get into control, you're moving into witchcraft. And it's pure evil. And it may start out in the flesh,
but it gets demonic very quickly. Now, I want to close with this uh, vision James Maloney had. Wonderful man of God. I had the honor of getting to know a little bit before he passed and had him pray with me. But he saw tremendous miracles. He used to tell me about them, and it just it moved my heart. So anyway, he shares this story in a book he wrote. Again, his last name is Maloney. The book is called The Lord in the Fires. And this chapter is increasing in the awe of God. So I'm going to read this. It'll just take me just a moment, but I think that it'll be a blessing to you. So he says here, a little while back, the Lord graced me with an open vision. I've only had one of these in my life. And so he had this open vision. He said, I trust by this time, if you've read through my previous works, you know a little bit about me, but I'm going to skip all that. And he said, nevertheless, the Lord gave me this open vision. And he said, what I mean by this is I saw it with my eyes and I wasn't like transported in the vision. This wasn't, it wasn't a dream. I was awake, but this wasn't just like watching a movie either. He said, it was like I was in this vision. And he said, I could see, I could smell, I could what was in the vision he said i experienced it like i was literally in it but it wasn't a dream it was a vision so he says this then he goes on to say i trust that you're familiar with an earthly tabernacle the outer court the holy place the holy of holies you guys familiar with that yet (laughs) i teach on that all the time okay so he says so this pavilion that he was in represents the holy place so that remember that's where the lampstand and then all that was okay He said that he was in this pavilion and it was not overly ornate or fancy, but it wasn't dirty or cheap either, just sort of basic and functional. Oddly enough, though, it wasn't the Old Testament time with a bunch of men in robes and like big Moses beards watching sheep or anything. He said there was a few hundred Christians in there, maybe 400. They were dressed modern. Many, if not all of them, were in need of some type of miracle, some type of physical healing. I could see people were hurting. They were blind eyes, deaf ears, tumors, crippling diseases, just a mess of humanity waiting in this pavilion. I could sense that they were eagerly anticipating ministry for their healing. And I knew behind me was the outer court that in this particular vision went down like a set of steps, and it was like leaving a building. And outside there was the sunlight, And he said, it was warm and nice in the holy place. It was comfortable. And he said he saw the lit lampstands. They were real beautiful and emanated warm light. The table of showbread was there, the altar of incense, and it had this intoxicating, beautiful smell to it of the incense. He said, don't misunderstand me. It was beautiful. But he said, here's the problem, though. The people were still sick and suffering. And he said, I found this strange. This was the tabernacle of God. These were his people, yet they were still suffering. My heart longed for them. And an angel appeared and escorted me between the wall and the pavilion and a row of seated people in the very front. And right there in the front, he said, were these two flaps. And it was a veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And this angel was standing beside one of the flaps and these two cherubim reached out and they lifted the flaps. And when they did, this warm flood of light filled the holy place, a wave of indescribable glory emanated out of the holy of holies. And it was so bright that the lampstand, it just overshadowed the lampstand completely. He said, even the sunshine outside in the outer court, this was much more of a bright light that came in and people oohed and awed and basked in the glow. And it felt really good just to have that level of glory upon us. And some people were improved physically because of it, but they weren't completely healed. Yet they seem content. Here's the problem. Everybody say contentment. You can, there's a good contentment, but there's a bad one too. They were content just to sit there in their condition. And you say, yet they seem content to just sit in this level, absorbing a portion of the power, but they made no motion to go beyond the lifted veil. And the angels beckoned all of us to go into the Holy of Holies, invited us to go deeper. How many knows Jesus ripped the veil? We can go in now. 
And they seem saddened that all of us, the angels were sad that all of us were not rushing into the Holy of Holies. Here they were opening the doors and people were enraptured in this warm rays of light spilling out. And, and Maloney was watching this in this vision and he thought to himself, are they scared? Maybe. Did they feel unworthy? Perhaps. But he said, mostly I think that they were weighed down by dullness a lack of understanding that moved them to a place of complacency. He said, I'm not minimizing their experience, but that level of encounter with God wasn't enough to see him completely free. And there was no, there was no excuse because the invitation to enter was for everybody and it was available. And he said, he said I said to myself, what, are you kidding me? And he said, of course I'm going in. So he said, I walked toward the open flaps and only three other people went with me. One man had a cane. Another one was dragging his leg as he shuffled and a woman utilizing a walker. Uh, I'm sorry, and the last was in a wheelchair. So there was a cane, a walker, and a wheelchair and they all ran in with him. The moment we passed beyond the veil into the most holy place, words fell me to properly describe the overwhelming awesome presence that bowled over us in this place the light wasn't the lampstands it wasn't even the sun outside this was the shekinah glory and he said the lord he said i didn't see the father on the throne i uh, i saw four and twenty elders who were worshiping him and he said i saw bolts of fiery lightning crash i heard thunder sounds of trumpets royal tapestries beyond human description, arrayed in colors that cannot be replicated on the earth. And everywhere there were like lights, shafts and beams of glory emanating from the Father of lights himself. Waves of his glory rolled over us and we fully immersed in that. The single greatest renewing experience I've ever had, it was energizing, almost like God's love and life were given visible form in waves of light washing over us. And then the shockwave hit us and we bowled over, slain in the spirit like dead men, the anointing and the reverence was almost too much to handle. We bask in this unrestrained glory of God for a few minutes and I staggered back to my feet. The angels reopened the flaps, letting uh, some of that fire and heat escape into the holy place. When I exited the holy place, into the holy place, sorry, I saw all the people anticipating for me to minister to them and somehow express the glory I had just witnessed to them vicariously. It's as if they wanted to experience the glory of God, but from a distance. I was reminded of Exodus 33 when Moses and Joshua went into the tabernacle and every man stood at his tent door. They themselves didn't want to go forward to enter in. They were content to get a secondhand experience from Moses. Did everybody catch that? So these people in the holy place, they were blessed, yes, but it was just in measure. And the angel led me past them down the steps to the outer court where I found myself uh, 15 or 20 people waiting down the curb they were mostly unchurched unsaved now isn't this interesting based on some things i've said tonight in this vision the church people were content but yet when he went out to the unchurched they wanted it is this making sense he got out there to them and he said this he said the angel told me to minister to them and i did and it was amazing the expression of god's power and love the demonized were delivered that's the first thing he saw all manner of physical need was healed. Whatever they were struggling under didn't matter. The Lord's grace was sufficient for them all. They were saved. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began praising God as their physical infirmities were healed. It was awesome seeing the wonderful breakthroughs and salvations. But in the back of my mind, I still felt sad for the hundreds of Christians in that holy place. While I was finishing ministering, the angel led me back inside past the waiting Christians in the, in the flaps that were opened a second time. Again, inviting everybody to come in. The door was, the veil was drawn back. I saw, and when the veil was opened again, he said, I saw the cane fly out. I saw the walker fly out. And lastly, the wheelchair was pushed out empty. It was then I came out of the vision, both exhilarated praising God as his power came over me, yet also disheartened that so many of the people remained in the holy place but went no farther see those kinds of miracles only took place in the holy of holies i'm convinced this is where it's coming to people must come boldly into the most holy place for themselves hebrew 4 16 jesus has rent the veil separated that did separate us from god's glory 
but most Christians seem reluctant to enter all the way in. I maintain that the majority of these kinds of miracles will happen in the Holy of Holies where the fullness of the glory is manifest, where we are intimate with the Father's eminence. We are coming to an era of time very quickly. I believe it will start with the church leadership first where God demands that his people press beyond the veil of flesh and enter into the holiest place in order to see the greater works, the greater expressions, the greater miracles. Not to downplay the measure that we have, but there's more. There's a deeper place. And I'm telling you, the very first thing he saw when he went out there was deliverance from demons. And I remember reading a vision. I'm, I'm going to close right now as we pray. But I remember reading another vision where this guy had had an encounter with the Lord. And the Lord showed him that they would be people that would be given different types of ministries. And some of them would really have a healing ministry. And others were given a deliverance ministry. He said those that really had a deliverance ministry, real powerful. He said they were also given the gift of discerning of spirits so that they would know what they're dealing with to cast it out. I thought that was interesting. I never forgot that because I've been, sometimes God has used me in that way. But here's, here's what I want us to pray. God, I believe in this last great move of the Lord before Jesus comes. I believe every revival that has been is needing expression. How many are wanting to see the Lord save the lost? I mean, save to the uttermost. People that others said, man, that guy will never get saved. Those people. How many want to see, I mean, people saved that, that others have given up on? I'm talking a harvest of souls. Okay, that I believe is coming. And then also, how many want to see major healings and miracles? I've been praying into this. I'm talking greater than the 40s and 50s, greater than Azusa Street, major healings and miracles. All right. You see, the Lord's holding us to this. We're in here saying stuff. Uh, it's, it's coming. And when it comes and the persecution comes with it, we better not complain. Amen. So I'm believing for tremendous healings and miracles and major deliverances. But that means if you want deliverances, that means you've got to be okay with some of the crazy stuff that happens in deliverance. And people shout out, collapse on the ground, slither, shake, loud scream, or whatever. You've got to be comfortable with the mess that comes with it. But the other side of it is so beautiful to see people set free. Amen. How many want to see people baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire? We need to get back to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, tongues, the power of God. And so Carlos Anacondia said in the Argentine revival, he said, I always made room in my meetings. Now, he had to go outside the church and minister in the ghettos. He would set up a tent and he would preach out on the streets. He would always go to the poor areas. That's interesting, isn't it? And it would force anybody that was rich or uppity or whatever, it would force them, if they wanted God to touch them, to go into the ghetto and sit by those in the ghetto. How many knows God gives grace to the humble? He always set up his tent somewhere in the ghetto. And here's what he said when I ministered. He said, I would always make room for all four of those things. When he would get up to preach, Brother Carlos would always take authority. There'd be people under the platform praying and, and like Brianna does, praying in the spirit. And he would get up there and the very first thing he did, all these lost people are out there. I mean, thousands of them. In Jesus' name, he said, I bind you, Satan. I command you. And he started taking authority over Satan, over those people. And he said that, and this happened all the time, people start manifesting spirits and collapse. And they had to figure out what to do with these people because they had to preach the gospel. And so they got a team of people. I think they lovingly called it the snake pit, but they had a team of people that rush out there with a little cot, roll them on the cot and run them back into the snake, snake pit. And they had people in there that would pray for them to get delivered, lead them to Christ. While Carlos had this huge group out here and it was a direct confrontation with Satan's kingdom. It was a in-your-face confrontation with hell he would bind the enemy and he would command satan to let them go and then he would preach the gospel and they'd get saved and then he would say who needs to get healed of things he'd pray for the sick and then they were already de dealing with deliverance issues and then he would say this we're going to pray for the baptism in the holy ghost he'd pray for him and they get back to his holy spirit he made sure that the opportunity for people to be saved healed delivered and baptized in the holy spirit all four 
were taking place in his meetings. And all four happened. So let's get back to that. I'm believing God for the expression of all of those things in this revival. That it's not just going to be about deliverance. It's not just going to be about healing, but it's going to be all of it. Okay, but the main thing is people getting saved. So, Lord, I thank you tonight as we close this out. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power. And, Lord, we thank you in the days to come for a great revival, Lord, to see a harvest of souls, Lord, to see healings and miracles like never before, to see people baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lord, to see people delivered from whatever Satan's had in their life. And we agree as a church, and I believe everybody's agreeing with me, Lord, do it here. I know that you'll move in other places too, and we honor that. But Lord, don't pass us by. We, we are a group of people that are willing. We've count, count the cost. We know there's persecution that goes with the move of God. We've counted the cost. We're ready for that. Lord, we're asking you to come down and save to the uttermost release healings and miracles, signs and wonders, the likes of which we've never read about in church history, except back maybe in the book of Acts. But Lord, release deliverance to the captives. Set those free in darkness, whatever the devil's had. And Lord, baptize in the Holy Ghost and with fire. Let the gifts be in operation. Lord, let there be demonstrations of your power. Let there be a direct confrontation with the devil that will break his power over the masses. Lord, let there would be, as Reinhard Bonnke used to say, plunder hell to populate heaven. Lord, let it come. And Lord, we thank you for it. If you've got to move outside of denominations, if you've got to move outside of much of the church world, we're willing to go set up something somewhere, or maybe to get some kind of a warehouse or something. Wherever you want to send us, wherever you're going to move to bring in that harvest and do what you want to do, that's where we're going. Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, there was a movie just come out. I didn't see it or anything, but about deliverance. Um, there was some different deliverance ministries that put it together. But somebody had sent a picture. It said that at the movie theater, people were being delivered from the demonic as they watched the movie. <laughs> 